if in this moment today, I was to step into your skin, where would I feel shame? Would I find it rooted in your family? In a decision or decisions you made years ago? Or in your own appearance or abilities? Maybe you've done everything you can to deny it, reject it, and cast it onto others, and yet it lingers. You feel as if you are somehow defective. And this has colored your whole world. Where would I feel shame? And where would I feel fear? Is it fiercely gripping at your heart, refusing to let go? Fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of abandonment, fear of death. Fear which has found its way into the driver's seat of your life and refuses to let go. Where would I feel fear? And where would I feel guilt? Do you find a way to beat yourself up for every misstep you or someone close to you makes? Are you swimming in a sea of regret, longing to turn back the hands of time, wishing you could do or say something differently? Are you plagued by voices constantly condemning your every move? Where would I find guilt? The irony is that the harder we try to extract these things from our lives, the more deeply rooted they become. We tug and tug, desperately wanting freedom, but it's like a Chinese finger trap. The harder we pull, the tighter its grip on us. Shame, fear, and guilt become the wellspring out of which we live our lives driving the driving force behind all of our thoughts, actions, and attitudes, without us even realizing that they've taken over. My question this morning is, how can we find freedom from the shame, fear, and guilt that so often enslaves us? How can the very core of our being, our hearts, be transformed in such a way that we live out of love instead. If you have your Bibles this morning, please turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, it's a long chapter. We're going to begin in verse 36. I'll give you a second to get there. Luke chapter 7. <clears throat> beginning in verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. We don't know exactly where Jesus was or what he was doing, but we're told that a Pharisee invited him over for a meal. Jesus accepts his offer and they begin winding their way through the dusty streets to his house probably followed by a large crowd, as Jesus often was. They were going to the Pharisee's house. You see, at this point in his ministry, Jesus was largely accepted and loved by the general public, but the jury was still out as far as the Pharisees were concerned. They were the religious leaders and teachers of the day, and in fact, most of them were not too fond of the things that Jesus had been doing and saying lately. It's likely that this particular Pharisee wanted to check Jesus out for himself. Who was this man? Was he really a prophet? What did he really have to say? What better way to find out than over some pita and hummus? Now, much like modern day celebrities, whatever Jesus did and wherever he went, word got around. And not just to the well-to-do. We read again in verse 37, and a woman in town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. 
the camera pans to the shady side of town. Focusing in on a woman who is, in a sense, the town sleaze. We don't know the exact nature of her sin, but it's probable that she was a prostitute because her sinful life was no secret. When she finds out that Jesus is eating with a Pharisee in town, she immediately sets out to cross the threshold of a house she never would have dared to cross before. But things had changed. You see, unlike the Pharisee, this woman sinful as she was, knew who Jesus was. He was the one John the Baptist had proclaimed. He was the one who could forgive sin. He was the Savior, the Messiah. He was her Savior, her Messiah. She wanted to honor him and to show him her gratitude by anointing his head with her most prized possession, an alabaster jar of perfume. This seems weird to us. <laughs> but at the time, okay, this, it, it's hard for me to overestimate the value of this little jar of perfume. Um, in fact, the contents were worth upwards of an entire year's wages. So just think with me for a minute, how much money do you make in a whole year? Okay, and then that's the price tag of this little jar of perfume. Okay, and at the time, there was no spray function on this perfume. Okay, that hadn't been invented yet. Uh, so we have this alabaster jar. Alabaster is like a marble. And they would put the perfume inside and seal it. And then when you used it, you had to actually break the jar. And then it was a one-time deal. Okay, there was no way to seal it again. So um, it had to be used all at once. The jar was broken, and that was it. Evidently, to this woman, this sinful woman, Jesus was worth that much. And as she hastened through the streets to the Pharisee's house, her heart began to pound. How many scathing stares had she endured in the past? In the eyes of the town, and of the Pharisees especially, she was filthy and contagious. She didn't belong in the house of a Pharisee, but she had to get to Jesus. That's what mattered most. And as she walks, perhaps she begins to picture what would happen. First, I'll slip in as quietly as possible, with my head down so maybe no one will notice me. There are bound to be lots of people there sitting and listening to Jesus. With that many people, I just might be able to go unnoticed. Jesus will be reclining at the table with the other teachers. If, if he's on the end, I'll be able to reach his head. And I'll pour the perfume on his head, whisper thank you, and slip out before anyone can throw me out. She replays the scene over and over again in her head, making slight adjustments until she realizes She's there, at the threshold. This was the point of no return. Taking a deep breath and ducking her head, she slipped inside the house and into the room where they were all eating. Sure enough, the room was crowded. Spotting Jesus, she makes her way toward him, all the while realizing that there are men reclining on either side of him and she won't be able to reach his head. But in my imagination, as she reached his feet, he sensed her presence and looked up. For a moment, their eyes locked. And in his face, she saw both recognition and acceptance. Knowledge and love. In the faces of men before, she had only seen disgust or lust. Jesus was different. Forgetting her surroundings and her resolve, she broke down. The evidence of her profound relief, regret, gratitude, and love coursed down her face in a torrent of tears. 
Her shoulders shook with the weight of the years of shame and guilt and fear being lifted. And as her mind replayed all of the sinful things that she had done, she was overcome again by the fact that she was forgiven. A fresh burst of tears made their way down the curves of her face and landed one by one on the feet of the one she loved, her Savior. And as she slowly regained control, she realized that she had soaked Jesus' feet and had no towel to wipe them with. Without thinking, she quickly knelt, unfastened her hair, and used it to wipe his filthy feet clean and dry. It wasn't long before the deafening silence and piercing stares of everyone in the room snapped her back into reality. She became keenly aware of her disheveled hair and tear-streaked face, and overwhelmed, she remembered why she had come. She decided to settle for anointing his feet instead, and quickly retrieving the alabaster jar of perfume from the folds of her cloak, she broke the jar and poured it over his feet kissing them with respect and gratitude. A new aroma slowly seeped through the room. The familiar smells of sweat, dirt, and meat were overcome by a wonderfully rich, fresh, and sweet scent. Every eye was on the woman. All were holding their breath, waiting to see what Jesus would say and do. And in the meantime, the host is drawing conclusions. We read in verse 39, When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, Self, this man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She's a sinner. See, if this man had any doubts previously about whether or not Jesus was a prophet, he now knew that Jesus was not. He didn't even know who this sinful woman touching him was, and that was common street knowledge. And now that he had allowed her to touch him, he wouldn't even be allowed to go to the temple, into God's presence, before going through all of the cleansing rituals. He himself, a Pharisee, would never allow a woman like that to touch him. At this point, we're all expecting Jesus to address the woman, right? Like the other dinner guests, we hold our breath, what will his verdict be? But instead, he addresses the host, whose name we learn is Simon. Ironically, while Simon is accusing Jesus in his thoughts of a lack of knowledge, Jesus is literally reading his thoughts and speaks in response to them. Jesus replied to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon must have been taken aback considering the situation. What could Jesus have to say to him, a righteous man, with that sinful woman sitting at his feet. But keeping his composure and self-respect, he replied, Teacher, say it. And Jesus, as he so often did, responded with a parable. Read with me, beginning in verse 41. A creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. That's about two years' wages and the other 50 denarii, which is about two months' wages. Since neither could pay it back, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, "Uh, I suppose the one he forgave more? You have judged correctly, Jesus told him. But this is the only thing that Simon judges correctly. Turning to the woman, Jesus says to Simon, Do you see this woman? You judge her, but do you 
see her? This is a legitimate question. Up until this point, Simon has not, in fact, seen this woman. He has only seen her actions. When he looks at her, he sees a shameful, hopeless sinner. What he fails to see is her transformed heart, full of humility, generosity, gratitude, and love. This woman is beautiful. And here we come to what Jesus really wants to say to Simon. Listen carefully, starting in verse 44. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for your feet, for my feet. But she, with her tears, has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with even olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loves much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Jesus then addresses the woman for the first time, assuring her of what she already possessed, saying, your sins are forgiven. Simon, embarrassment creeping up his neck and face, is speechless. Everyone else, however, begins talking at once, saying, Who is this man who thinks he can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Who is this man? Jesus ignores their not-so-silent protests. And while they're distracted, arguing among themselves, he turns to the woman and speaks directly to her heart. Beginning in verse 50, And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We are left wondering with the other guests, who is this man? Who is this man who forgives sins? Who lifts up the humble and casts down the proud? Who gives peace? He is the very Son of God who later would humbly wash his own disciples' feet and generously lay down his very life because of his unfathomable love for us sinners. What incredible hope we are given in this story. You see, our hearts are transformed when the depth of our need meets the fullness of God's forgiveness. Our hearts are transformed when our guilt and shame and fear come face to face with Jesus. We are no longer enslaved by sin, but are free to live lives driven by love, humility, generosity, and gratitude. But in order to be transformed, we must first recognize the depth of our need. It is only when we have a proper perspective of ourselves that we can appreciate the magnitude of what God has done for us. One of my old professors, Tim Lane, says this. Think about the song, Amazing Grace. It's not, ho-hum grace, how okay the sound that came and helped a pretty nice person like myself along. This is not a worship dynamic that is going to fuel change. But whether the sin in our lives tends, to be, lives tends to be more public, like the woman, or private, like Simon's, we are all deeply marred by sin and in need of a Savior. Simon's actions in this story, and for that matter his thoughts, reveal the true state of his heart. He comes to Jesus as a skeptic, 
instead of as a sinner, and therefore knows nothing of the salvation and forgiveness that Jesus brings. Simon does not recognize his need for Jesus, and as a result, he loves little. This is the point of the parable. Not only does he not go above and beyond for Jesus, he doesn't even perform the normal courteous acts expected of a host at the time, like providing water for his feet, oil for his head, or a kiss of greeting. In Simon's mind, he has no need for Jesus. He's simply a good theological conversation partner, and his attitude and actions reflect that. And even in the small glimpse we get of Simon, we can see how Simon is motivated by fear. Fear of how others might view him. Fear of ruining his reputation. Fear that the tower of righteousness that he has built for himself might come crashing down. He has dealt with his sin by covering it up with a righteous sod. And before we judge Simon too harshly, let's take a quick look at ourselves. How many of us have tried to work ourselves out of a need for Jesus? How many of us have tried to work ourselves out of our need for Jesus? We go to church and Bible study. We try not to drink too much, to swear, to raise our voices when we get angry. At prayer meetings, we share about our family's need and our neighbor's need, but say nothing about the sin that has its grip on our lives. We, like Simon, follow all of the rules to a T, convincing ourselves and maybe even others that we have it all together, that we have no need. But then we have no love. We have no humility, no gratitude or generosity. We do not experience the transforming power of forgiveness because we do not think there is anything we need to be forgiven of. Once again, this is the point of the parable. Many times we want to identify ourselves with the loving actions of the woman in this story, but not with her sinfulness. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot be truly transformed by God's forgiveness if you never come face to face with the depth of your sin. Take a moment and think about some areas of shame, fear, and guilt that we identified at the beginning of the message. These three things are a result of the fall. While not all shame, fear, and guilt is sin, it's all a result of sin done either by us or to us, and it often leads us into further sin. Shame frequently leads to pride or self-condemnation. We hold people at arm's length, either pretending we're too good for them or believing that they're far too good for us, both of which lead to hiding, hiding of one's true self for fear that someone might uncover who you really are. Fear often leads to sinful patterns of control and manipulation. We fear failure, which breeds perfectionism. This fear leads us to control our work, our school, our homes, and even our children and spouses. Yes, fear leads to sinful patterns of control. And guilt pushes us to seek appeasement, in our own pleasure or pain. We take comfort in overeating or we work or we punish ourselves by undereating. We refuse to get out of bed in the morning or we work 24-7 trying to make up for something. And all of these coping mechanisms often lead to further guilt which just perpetuates the cycle. Is there any doubt that we are in deep need? Need of a savior to rescue us from this tangled mess. But after we've recognized the depth of our need, we must accept the fullness of God's forgiveness. When we allow the fullness of God's forgiveness to wash over our fear, shame, and guilt, these things are replaced with love and humility, generosity and gratitude. In other words, we're made new. 
Jesus says, the one who is forgiven much loves much. The woman in the story is a beautiful picture of what it looks like to be transformed. She has drunk deeply of the well of God's forgiveness and come up full. How, you may ask? Through faith. In verse 50, Jesus says, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. She simply believed and accepted the incredible gift that Jesus extended to her. The same gift that he extends to you and to me. Throughout this story, we see the fruits of her, of her faith. Despite her past, she is motivated wholly by her love and gratitude towards Jesus. She is bold and yet humble, kneeling at his feet, washing them with her tears. She is generous, pouring out literally her life savings. She knew her need. Her many sins had been forgiven. Therefore, she loved much. What about you? Do people say about you, Josh, Aaron, Carol, Nicole, man, that person really loves really loves other people well. Think about the hundreds of decisions that you make every day. What is driving those decisions? Is it love, love for God and love for others? Or is it something else? What are you trying to hide? What are you trying to avoid and why? What are you trying to make up for? We'll all have different answers to these questions, but I encourage you to take some time and sit before God, even as we go into communion, and ask him to reveal these things to you. Because when you've identified where shame, fear, and guilt have taken up residence in your heart, you can take them to Jesus. Ask for and accept his full forgiveness. And when we accept God's forgiveness, our guilt is replaced with innocence. When we accept God's forgiveness, our fear is cast out by God's perfect love. And when we accept God's forgiveness, we accept with it a new identity which replaces our shameful self with one that is clothed in Christ's righteousness. Yes, forgiveness is transformational. In Christ, we are innocent, love and made new. In a moment, the worship team is going to come up and um, play Amazing Grace, actually, while we take communion. We take communion in remembrance of the love that God has for us, love that took him to the cross on our behalf to reconcile us to God and make us new. All of us in this room are in a different place in our faith journey. And if you have never come to Jesus, confessed your sin, and received his forgiveness, today is the day. Don't wait another second to be free. So many of us have been walking with Jesus for a long time. But somewhere along the way, this past week, month, year, decade even, we've slowly turned into Simon. Self-righteous, self-reliant, too caught up in ourselves to truly love anyone else. Bring your guilt, your shame, your fear to the feet of Jesus again. Ask in his love and forgiveness. Go in peace.